Welcome to an episode of the award-winning podcast Art Insiders New York. My name is Anders Holst. The theme of the podcast is New York, with a focus on behind-the-scenes conversations with fascinating people who are making an impact in the world of art, design, and architecture. Richard Florida is a professor at the University of Toronto's Rotten School of Management and School of Cities and distinguished visiting fellow at New York University's Shack Institute of Real Estate. He is a co-founder and editor-at-large of CityLab and a senior editor at The Atlantic. Richard Florida, dubbed by Fast Company as an intellectual rock star, is best known for his concept of the creative class and its implications for urban regeneration, expressed in Florida's best-selling book, The Rise of the Creative Class from 2002. We talk about the pandemic and how it may affect the future of working life, the genius of Jane Jacobs, the Bilbao effect, and the importance of intuition in his academic work. We also talk about how the creative class, back to the city movement, finds a home for itself amidst the hotbed of controversial social-cultural topics, gentrification, displacement, and inequity. Richard also explains his vision for the future on how to choreograph a more powerful dialogue to solve these issues. Richard, thank you so much for taking the time to be a guest on uh, Art Insiders New York podcast. You are specialized in an area that is very near and dear to us. I don't know if you've uh, looked at the various episodes, but uh, we've touched upon this uh, um, uh, subject of urban innovation and urban growth and gentrification and so forth in uh, several episodes. Actually, we had James and Carla Murray on the show. They talk, they've specialized in the mom and pop store, the disappearing face of, of New York and how the mom and pop stores are very important for the for the local community. We had uh, Matt Turnauer, the director of the documentary, uh, Citizen Jane, The Battle for the City, and I did some research on you, and, and Jane Jacobs uh, comes up uh, several times. And uh, also, of course, uh, an episode about uh, Soho, uh, how Soho became Soho. So the first question is, what does a urban studies scientist do? I'm not sure. Um, and that's the truth. Um, you know, I'm a kid from Newark. And um, if you guys know Newark, it's a city outside of New York City that's been very depressed. It, it had a very big urban crisis. Uh, I saw Newark go up in flame in the riots during the 1960s as a young boy. And my father worked in a factory called Victory Optical, making eyeglasses. I saw that factory when it was a burgeoning factory. And then I saw it uh, close and undergo deindustrialization. My mom was an ad ta taker at the Star Ledger. And I remember the Star Ledger when there was no fences and barbed wire surrounding it. And then I remember going with my dad to pick her up from work and seeing fences and barbed wire. And I think that's how I became an urban scientist, I think, uh, or whatever I am. Um, I, I just became, as a, as a young boy, uh, when I wasn't playing rock and roll guitar, blues rock guitar, I was, I was interested in cities. And um, That became a lifelong passion. And to be honest, Andres, um, you know, I was I was a guitar player. I was in bands. Uh, I had a rollicking youth in the mid 70s when I went to college. Uh, I went to college from 1975 to 1979 at Rutgers, a pretty amazing time. And I guess, you know, I had to graduate and figure out something to do. And I wasn't going to cut my long hair and beard and take out my earring and go to work on Wall Street. Like that <laughs> clearly wasn't in the cards for me. And I I didn't think law school was an option. So other than rock and roll guitar player, the next thing open to me was urbanist. And what happened was, to be honest, when I was in college, um, one of our professors gave us an assignment to literally take the train, the Amtrak train to New York City and, and go look at all the neighborhoods, Chelsea, the Meatpacking District, Tribeca, yeah. Soho. The, and, and I think that's what hooked me, to be honest. And uh, what do I do? I mean... I kind of observe cities. I do basically, if you read Citizen Jane or you talk to those folks, I do what Jane Jacobs did. I observe cities with my two eyes. Now in academia, you know, there is this idea that you're supposed to collect data and do surveys and look at census statistics. And I mean, I work with really good, I have no idea how to do that myself, but I work with really good people who know how to do all of that. And yeah. So we combine my observations and hunches and insights with their ability to do technical academic stuff. And one other thing, You know, Jane Jacobs and I talked a lot about this and, and she told me, like, why the hell did you go to a university? Like, she had, like, what would you do that for? And she said, when she started to write her 
first book that became Death and Life of Great American Cities, um, she wrote an essay, I think it was for Forbes or Fortune, one of those, uh, called something Downtown is for People. And it was a very famous essay back in the late 50s. Um, and all of these great professors from Harvard and MIT descended upon her. And they, they took her to lunch at 21, which she said was great. I got this great free lunch out of them. And they said, you know, you need to do surveys. You need to look at data. You need to come to Harvard. You need to work with us. And she said, oh, my God, if this these people talk to me in this kind of condescending patriarchal tone, can I can you only imagine what they do to their students? And her point was, you didn't need all that bullshit. Yeah. You needed to observe cities in real life with your own eyes and kind of figure out what they're about. So that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to be more like Jane. I see. Well, um, we all love Jane. She, she's, uh, she was a genius. And um, a lot of what she talks about is something that uh, resonates with us now that when we walk the streets of New York. Now, The Economist has described you as close to a household name as it is possible for an urban theorist to be in America. Esquire included you in the annual list of the best and the brightest and fast company dubbed you an intellectual rock star, the prophet of placemaking, and the king of downtown revival. And someone said, the patron saint of the avocado toast. What is that about? Yeah, I've never had avocado toast. I, I like burgers and like, you know, breakfast sandwiches. But uh, look, it's probably stemmed from the fact that I wanted to be a rock star when yeah. I was a kid. And I'm not a, I'm not a traditional academic. You know, I, I'm from Newark. I'm from New York. I grew up in New York and lived in New York in the 80s. You know, and I have a different demeanor, you know, than most. When people meet me, they go like, you don't look like Richard Florida. Like, that's really interesting. Like, you don't look like you're, and, and I'm older now, but especially then, like, you're younger than we thought. You look different than we thought. Yeah. I don't know. Um, the other thing is, you know, I think because of playing rock and roll, I developed the ability to communicate. I, I'm a terrible singer. I'm a good guitar player, but I had to sing because no one else would sing. So, you know, being a lead guitar player and front person in a band helps you learn how to like communicate. And uh, I also think being a, a professor lecturer helped me learn how to communicate. I think I'm, I'm actually an okay. I'm, I'm not a very good writer actually, although I've written a lot. I'm, I'm a much better verbal communicator. Yeah. So I think that when I wrote rise of the creative class, which was like my fifth book, by the way, not my first book, all the others were miserable failures. <laughs> uh, and I think that gave me a platform to communicate and that my ability to communicate may, meant that like real people wanted to hear what I said or like mayors and, and that, that created a platform for me and and led to all of that. You know, there's a fellow named Paul Glastris who he didn't mention. He was editor of the Washington Monthly. He still is editor of the Washington Monthly. He's a brilliant man. And uh, he read The Rise of the Creative Class before it was published back in 2002. And he put an essay in his magazine, The Washington Monthly, which was an extract of that book. And, and it's really what, it's not me. It's Paul that made that book a bestseller. And the headline was not The Rise of the Creative Class. It was why cities with gays and rock bands will win the economic war. And look, I think that simple headline, to be honest with you, made, created the platform for me. And then, you know, I'm a good, I'm a kid from Newark. I'm an Italian American. We talk a lot. I'm a good bullshitter. And there you go. <laughs> Well, um, you're a professor and head of the Martin Prosperity Institute uh, at the Rothman School of Management at the University of Toronto. You're also a distinguished visiting fellow at the New York University at the Shack Institute of Real Estate. You're also co-founder and editor-at-large of City Lab and senior editor uh, of The Atlantic. Now, so how do you divide your time between all these different things? Well, you know, I sit in this little room behind a, a computer and I work all day. I think predominantly, I think, and I write. So there's City Lab. And for City Lab, you know, uh, David Bradley, when he owned the Atlantic, he's now sold it. I had pitched this idea of an of a site for talking about cities. Like, you know, you have people talking about business or foreign affairs or entertainment and all these parts of a newspaper. I said, well, cities and places are more important. And no one ever thought that took that serious. David Bradley did. And he helped us create City Labs. And City Labs now since moved to Bloomberg, but it's quite thriving. And I I write a lot less. I used to write for them twice a week. Now I write for them like once or twice a month. Uh, so I work with my research team. Uh, I have a great team of people who are much smarter and technically capable of me than me. Then we write academic papers or book chapters and uh, they kind of run all of that and talk to the editors and I'm helpful and thoughtful and help create. So I run a nice research team of that in, yeah. at the University of Toronto. 
Um, I teach classes and increasingly I teach them over Zoom. So there you go. I'm do this, you know, and we invite <laughs> people from all over the world and to come talk to our kids, our, our MBA students. Yeah. Or at Shaq, our Masters of Real Estate students. Uh, with the creative class group, you know, I, I've been around a long time. I've been doing this for three or four decades. And over three or four decades, if you're not a complete asshole, you kind of develop a, a Rolodex, if you will, or an online Rolodex or a network. And uh, mayors have come to trust me. These people they call economic or economic, uh, urban developers, they've come to trust me. So with the creative class group, I do two things. One, I, I give speeches. I used to go to places and maybe in the fall, I'll go to places again and give speeches. Yeah. Nobody tells me what to say. I say whatever the hell I want and talk about these things. And then, so I do this. And then the second thing I do is I do some strategic consulting. I don't do a lot of it. We don't do big consulting projects. I tend to work with family foundations or university presidents, less with cities, but occasionally with cities, sometimes with really interesting corporations. And I do this. I give them advice on what they should and shouldn't do and what makes sense and really what the pitfall. So that's really how I organize my day. Yeah. Uh, and it's, a, I have to admit, I have, it's a lot of fun. And I, and right now I just sit in this third floor room and do it from here. Yeah. The first time I, I came across your work was I, um, I'm on the board of the American Friends of the National Museum of Sweden. And <clears throat> we were having a board meeting and we we're talking about the impact of culture uh, and economic growth. And someone mentioned the, the Bilbao Museum, of course. And and they said that you should really read um, Richard Florida's uh, book. Uh, that was the, the Rise of the Creative Class. So the Bilbao effect, I mean, that's an incredible um, thing that you realize that it has nothing to do with factories or uh, infrastructure. It has to do with basically an investment in uh, intangible assets in a way. I mean, there's a museum there. There's a building there designed by Frank Gehry. But um, it's this uh, mechanism of, of attracting people, creating a magnet. Uh, what is your view on the, on the Bilbao effect as it has been described? So I'm a big fan of Sweden. Uh, my Current m most capable technical collaborator is Swedish. Her name is Charlotte Melander. Without her, I wouldn't have written a lot of those papers that require econometrics and statistics. She's a whiz at this. I got an honorary degree from a university in Sweden. I got to wear a top hat mm. and uh, tails. That's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so I love Sweden and I miss it. One of the last trips I made was to Stockholm before the, the lockdown. So I oh. miss it. A lot of people either like my work or hate my work in Sweden. So I would say I have some notoriety in Sweden. Um, I take no credit for the Bilbao effect. Um, it has nothing to do with me. It has lots to do with people from Bilbao. I think they did a good job. One of the things I caution in my book, and I just want to be clear about this, is I I kind of was cri critical, not of Bilbao effect, but of, of making large uh, public investment in arts and cultural institution. I was very cautionary of making large public investments in public sports. And I said that making those investments in sports stadiums, football stadiums, basketball arenas is, is folly, The public sector should never do that. That's something the private entrepreneurs should do. I, I also made a slightly more nuanced argument in the book about investment in large cultural institutions. I said they're fine, and if philanthropy wants to invest in them, that's good. But I would I would caution large scale public investment. And the reason I said that is, I think the public investment is better served is direct investment in the arts and cultural community. And I. I call distinction between arts institutions, large scale institutions, which I called in that book, the SOBs, the symphonies, operas and ballets mm -hmm. and the investment in actual working artists. And I said at the margin, it would be great to invest more in actual artists. And the other thing I said is that it's, it's, it's best to invest in what I call street level arts and culture. Mm -hmm. So instead of investing in the arts and culture of the past, nothing wrong with that, but putting precious public dollars. Yeah. We're better off activating the the ongoing street level arts culture. But by the way, just to be honest, I have no business talking about arts and culture. And really in the book, this is a very short section of the book, mm -hmm. like a 500 page book. And I was just speculating in, at that time about the role of arts and culture in creating a creative firmament. And uh, for, uh, for to, to my great luck, a lot of people in the arts and commu culture community kind of embraced my work or thought it was reasonable and talked about it, but I didn't have them as a target audience. I was really talking to city leaders and mayors. So I think it's as a, as a failed guitar player <laughs> and as a failed musician and knowing how hard music is and not being very good at it or good enough at it um, to be embraced by the arts and music community was a big deal to me. And I, you know, it's still, I, I understand to be honest with you, 
Like, I really don't think of myself as an urban, whatever you call me, uh, or urban academic. I think of myself as a guitar player. Like, that's my identity as a kid. I think your identity as a kid is what you carry forward as an adult, and, and it never goes away. So even though I don't play my guitar very much, and I don't even have calluses, I play a couple times a year. Like, you put me in a guitar store... I kind of feel more at home in a guitar store than I do in a bookstore. And that's really odd to me because I don't, guitar is not my career, but it was my identity as a kid. And I think I still carry that forward. So to be embraced by the arts and music and cultural community was a big schmear to me. Yeah. But maybe that also enables you to see things that other people don't see in your research, in your, in your day job. So that's my only advantage. You know, there was a bright guy who hired me at, at the university of Toronto. His name is Roger Martin. He was the dean of our school, and he said something to me, and I've since heard it from others, that, Rich, you're really intuitive. Lots of people can take an intuition or what he called a heuristic and turn that into some kind of technical specification. But I've since met with, like, leading biologists and physicists, and we talk a lot about – Jane Jacobs was better – she was, like, a quintessential intuitive. I think that my – My only advantage or my only skill is this intuition. I have intuitions or the ability to put two different or three different things together that's somewhat unique. I think it's the only skill I really have. And, and I think that's it. My, my, my background gives me the ability to kind of perceive things, make hunches, guesses about cities that when others would test rigorously – that are that are somewhat interesting. So yeah, I think that's the only thing that I bring to the table. Really, to be <laughs> well, you bring um, a lot to the table, for yeah, instance, so. the, the creative class. So I was thinking maybe we should talk a little bit about the creative class. And for our listeners, what what is that? And what is the key concept of that? And then you, I listened to your new, uh, your, your recent book, uh, the urban, the new urban crisis. And then I'd like to talk about, uh, uh, and I wanted to do this for about a year, The, the pandemic, of course, and what we can expect from, you know, uh, urban work life. What are the consequences on this whole thing? So, you know, really what I'm about is I, I was a small M Marxist. So not not like a lover of the Soviet Union of China, but a very devotee of Karl Marx is writing about the nature of work and the nature of class and society and a devotee of Jane Jacobs. And all my work really tries to do is take the insights of Karl Marx about class and economy and the insights of Jane Jacobs about place and cities and put them together. So the creative class was my attempt to do that. So I said in modern society, uh, instead of just having a working class and a capitalist class, people who work with their backs and legs and arms uh, and then capitalists who own and control the means of production, we have a more variegated class structure. That in fact, in addition to the capitalist class, the 0.001% and own and control the means of production, We have three major classes. Uh, the first is the proletariat that Marx wrote about, the working class, which has now shrunk from a more, well more than half of the workforce, my dad was a member, to less than 20% of the workforce, and about 5% of the whole workforce actually do direct physical manufacturing work. Some people maintain machines, some people install things, some people drive trucks, some people build buildings, but about 5% of the workforce is left doing the stuff Marx said was the working class. Yeah. And then there are two other big classes that have grown immeasurably over the past 50 years. The first is the service class. We'll come back to them. They're the people who kind of wait on us, take care of us in grocery stores, take care of our kids, our families, bring us things, deliver our packages, work in Instacart or Ubers. And then there's the creative class. And uh, the service class is 45 to 50 percent of the workforce. The creative class is about a third of the workforce overall, 40 to 50 percent of the workforce in cities. There are people who work with their minds. Uh, so they're engineers, innovators, scientists, architects, you know, teachers, medical doctors, managers, fine, but also artists, musicians, designers. So you take them all up and, and you know, it's 33% of the workforce, 50% of the workforce in places like Sweden or in big cities. Yeah. And I said, you know, that class, because of its kind of class power, if you will, is kind of reshaping society. And I think it's been true. Uh, I wrote The New Urban Crisis to talk about the fact that this class, I mean, I, I, believed in rise of the creative class or prognosticated that this group of people would be more urban oriented. They like cities. They require, not like cities. They required cities. Knowledge work is different than factory work. Factory work can be spread out. Knowledge work or creative work has to cluster. People have to cluster together to do it. They've always had to do that. Now, since people have expanded that and tested that and shown that to be very true. Um, and then, in, you know, I said, 
we already were talking about this with a guy named Bill Bishop. He and I were already talking about this, the big sort, the sorting of the creative class and the working class and the service class in different areas. But what happened is, of course, this back to the city movement that I was wistfully thinking about in the year 2000 Mm -hmm. and over the next 20 years became something quite more powerful and potent than I ever imagined, that the creative class actually moved back to cities in ways that I never expected, creating gentrification, displacement, unaffordability, inequity. And, and the old urban crisis that I had talked about in Newark was a crisis of urban failure and dysfunction and deindustrialization and city collapse. The new urban crisis, which I wrote about in that book in 27, was a crisis of urban success. As wealthy people and affluent people and creative people and, and tech industries moved to cities, they priced other people out. So cities became increasingly divided, increasingly unequal, increasingly gentrified, unaffordable, boring, dull, divided. And yeah, I, and, and I think with the COVID crisis, just to put a point on it, like all of this has come full circle. Like in Rise of the Creative Class, I wrote this phrase. I said, what creative class people are looking for is to work on great projects with great people in great spaces and great places. Well, the COVID crisis has kind of brought that to a head, you know, with remote work and the ability not to have to go to this office and report like a factory soldier to a giant tower and commute you know, drive to the train and take the train to the subway and walk to work, people can have more of work-life balance. So I think that's what people are looking for. And, you know, it's really interesting to see your life work come full circle and people, all the questions I've been asking all my life, where should I live? Where, how should I balance work life? You know, how do I want to reset my personal life experience? They're all being asked by people all across the United States and Canada and all over the world. So that's pretty interesting. All the stuff I've worked on has become the topic of popular conversation. Yeah. Well, what do you see in your in your intuitive mind here? Are we are we going back to where we were, but we moved five degrees? Or are we going to come back to something that looks fairly different? Capitalism is a very nefarious beast. And it will do just about anything to extract value from people. So 20 years ago in Rise of the Creative Class, I said the fundamental contradiction, to use Marx's word in capitalism, was this contradiction between creative people who needed to have flexibility, freedom, the ability to do their own thing. They didn't like to be managed. They like to work to their own drummer. They like to structure their own time. They're like me or you. They don't like to be told what to do. Not like in a factory with an assembly line and a stopwatch. Yeah. Uh, we like to work more like musicians or artists than factory workers. So capitalism is giving us this illusion of freedom and flexibility. It is creating for us, it is evolving in ways behind our backs and over our heads uh, in ways that give us the illusion that we're freer, that we're, but we're not. We're still kind of slaves to this creative machine and we work like the Dickens, except it comes from inside. It, we're not being whipped and pushed in the assembly line, we're just intrinsically doing this to ourselves because capitalism has figured out a way to pump value out of us uh, by telling us we're better people by doing this and we're finding ourselves and all these other things. So look, and then, you know, for half the workforce, they don't have any of this. They're just, you know, they're working in routine service jobs, highly precarious, highly contingent, two and three jobs. So look, you know, I think we're an increasingly divided society. Uh, I think a third of us have great good for, you know, there's the 0.001%, the capitalist guys who have more money than ever before. We're more divided than at any point in modern history. You know, I live in Miami Beach in the winter. These these people literally go on a Zoom call like this and buy a $40 million mansion. Like, it's like one Zoom call, like, okay, I'll take it. Like, it's nuts. You know, this Palm Beach, New York City, LA, you know. And then there's the creative class, people like us who work with our minds, who have a pretty good uh, 33% of them. And then there's 66% who are just fundamentally screwed. And that permeates everything. I could go on and on about that, but that's where Trump comes from. That's where populism comes from. You know, the people who are left outside the cities and the service class and the working class are kind of terrified about their future, terrified about this change in society, terrified about these new creative values, which value freedom and liberty and, you know, the, ability to be yourself and your sexual orientation. And you get this incredible backlash. Look, though, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm reasonable. So that all said, I'm reasonably optimistic. My dad lived through a depression, a world war, polio. There were no vaccines. I mean, my dad, that's not that long ago. That's my father. I was telling my kids, my kids are four and five, had a pretty shitty life, you know, until until he got beyond World War II in the 50s and had two kids and could buy a house in the suburbs. But he still struggled like the Dickens. 
you know, we have vaccines, we have better medicine. We just got through a horrible pandemic. It was devastating, but, but, you know, I, I think we'll get through this. And I think we're finding balance. And maybe, you know, if we look ahead to the roaring 2020s, uh, which we're in already, you know, maybe we'll start to find our footing. Uh, that's my hope. I can't, I can't go to bed at night being, you know, all these people, the America's going to explode into a civil war and the war is going to come apart and we're, you hate one another. Ah. You know, one of the good things about the pandemic at this horrible thing is that people are getting over a lot of that bullshit. And, you know, like, I guess Trump was a real bummer and I hated the guy. And I think he's, I thought he was a bozo for my days in New York, but Look, people are now saying we got to get along. And, you know, I find people looking for places outside their bubble. And one of the things remote work says, I don't have to live in my goddamn blue bubble anymore. I can go live in a in a place and meet other people who think differently than me. And, you know, I don't hate them. I might not like Trump, but I don't hate. So I think we're, we're at a moment now where we have a shot. I'm not, I don't want to oversell this at coming together. Uh, and that, that gives me some hope. And whatever time I have left on this planet, I'll devote to have that. Now, the other thing, just to be honest with you, all this bullshit is 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 magnified at the national level. When, but when I talk to mayors, I have this my own podcast called The Mayors. I have Republican mayors on all the time. I don't know they're Republican. I think they're Democrats. I think all mayors are Democrats. And then the person tells me they're the Republican. And the Democrats and the Republicans are the same people. So when it comes to being a mayor of a city, I don't see these divisions that we see at the national level. So maybe there's a glimmer of hope there. So what are you working on now? What are the re research projects on the horizon? What's What's coming up for you? I'm working on one thing really now is to try to understand and make tangible what the post-pandemic geography might look like. I've written a bunch of pieces for City Lab and the Wall Street Journal, and I just had a conversation with the New York Times about this. And uh, I'm writing less. I'm think I find that I'm not a columnist. Writing two times a week is very tough for me. not tough. I can do it, but it doesn't allow me to think. I'm stepping back and I'm spending a lot more time talking to city leaders about because there's just a real demand about what this post-pandemic, not just city, city, suburb, rural area geography might look like. And that's really my project for the next time. I think my what I'd really like to do is I think there's one thing that I'd really like to accomplish. I think I did a good job of kind of communicating my field to the world and writing books that did that and then encouraging others to do that. I think I did a good job with City Lab creating a kind of journalistic platform and and spurring a rise of a generation of or a big generation of urban journalists who are terrific. Some write for the Washington Post, the New York Times. Our alumni are everywhere. I think the thing that I've not done yet is figure out a way, built a po podcast about mayors, figure out a way to communicate this up at, a, at a bigger platform. So what I think I'd love to do is if I could is figure out a way to do some kind of television series. Doesn't have to be me in it, but a television series, not a documentary, a television series that really explore with people in visual way, not me talking, a visual way, what people want in cities, what they want in suburbs, how, what they can find in places to live, what it means to them, and then how different forces in our lives are reshaping cities and suburbs and rural areas in our geography. And that's hard. I mean, I've been trying to do that for 20 years and failing miserably at it. So I think that's the one thing, if I had to say, what, what would I like to do next? It would be that maybe, maybe to create a bigger think tank. You know, you mentioned things I've created. I think we need something, a, a, a kind of a national or global think tank mm -hmm. that brings together the world's best urbanists and urban thinkers. I created the School of Cities at the University of Toronto or helped to create that. Yeah. Figuring that would spur more efforts at other places. But I think we need, I think this is so important, we need an even bigger effort. So that's what I'm up to. It's been great being with you, brother. Thanks for having me on the pod. Thank you so much, Richard. And good luck with your project. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you so much. Let me know when it runs. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode and have family and friends who love New York and are passionate about the world of art, design and architecture in the city, please spread the word by following us on artinsidersnewyork.com or liking us on our Facebook page, Art Insiders New York, where we publish newsworthy material all the time. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. This episode was produced by UOM LLC, copyright 2021.